I consider ducking an art form, recreating our masterpiece as we soar through the air. That's called an art. I wanted to show that I was a showman and I was an entertainer. Vince could just imagine himself doing something with a basketball, and then he could go do it. And that's where I've been for 22 years in the same mentality. To play as many years, you have to grow as a player, improve as a player. That's not easy. For him to maintain his excellence for this long is incredible. He will stand alone in a really unique place because he just kind of took his own path and evolved into this amazing story. Here's how you know what a big deal it is that Vince was able to do it and you know how hard it is, because no one else could. That's how you know, right? If it was easy, everybody would do it. If it was easy, anybody else would have done it. Guess what? No one ever has. That tells you how important Vince Carter was to the game and that this moment must be respected. I always talk about the ending and trying to see what does the ending look like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? How do I handle it? I make this now, at this age, my time, you know? And then once I get to the arena, it kind of goes from that me time to work time and just focusing on preparation for the game. Because like I said, it takes me longer to get ready than any of the other guys, so. What's up, man? You good? All right. I value these rides to the arena now, this year more than ever, because like I said, from here on out, <laughs> it won't be a ride to the arena to get ready for a basketball game. Now, it turns to work mode. The most difficult thing was believing that it's at the end and that it's time. Good. Because you never think it's time, but your body lets you know when it's time, <laughs> you know. But that's the most difficult thing. Actually, you know, saying to yourself, okay, it's over. That's the most difficult thing for any athlete. Is it kind of hard to accept that, you know, no no ceremony, no fanfare. That's how I feel. I'm not one for the whole thing anyway. So you ask a lot of people around me, they'll, you know, they'll tell you this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one, like, I, I'm appreciative, but, you know, I do my time and just walk out the door. It's okay with me, you know, believe it or not, but um, it's cool. <laughs> believe it or not, it's cool. I, I uh... I just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been good. Vince grew up in a pretty upscale suburban neighborhood was a good student in school. He got his work, stayed out of trouble. My entire family are all educators of some sort. School teachers, principals, you name it. So that's kind of how our household was. I taught him in my English class, um, which was wonderful because I knew he would do all the assignments and do what he had to do because that was required of Vince above everything else. We were a small family in, in the bigger scheme of things. It's my brother and I, and then sometimes just the three of us. You know, my, my aunt had one child, and that was it. My memory is always in the gym. <laughs> we always ended up in the gym. It was very structured. You had what was expected. Um, you know, your do's and don'ts, pleases and thank yous. Like, I mean, you were taught to be polite. Both of our mothers, very strong women, very strong women. Um, neither one of them played any games, you know, with us. And, uh, you know, Miss Michelle didn't play with anybody. My only thing was being an educator is to um, 
Try to develop the whole child. You're not just going to be an athlete. Vince played on his first organized team at seven. Vince always played one league up from his age. You couldn't find many kids anywhere that had what we describe as God-given talent that he has in that sport. He was, even at a young age, always trying to be better at what he was trying to do. He was in the band. He started playing the saxophone in the fifth grade. Fast forward to the end of the, the, their, their season, and he's first chair saxophone. His stepfather was the band director, so you didn't play there either. You know, I mean, you didn't play around. You went and did what you had to do. But he just always excelled at basketball, and for that matter, at volleyball, when he tried that. He went out for high jump on the spur of the moment. He didn't even have on the proper shoes. And he went out there and won. The fact that he even dunked for the first time when he was in sixth grade was crazy. The things he was doing as a young boy, many people couldn't do. And you know, at that time, Vince also played football. He was a quarterback. And I can remember after one game, my husband, Dennis, going to Michelle and saying, get him off the football team. He is a talented basketball player. He's gonna get hurt out there. Get him off. <laughs> my husband was rather forceful and we were all good friends, but he was sincere about that because he felt that Vince was gonna go places in basketball. I think when it finally hit me was when he was at Mainland. At Mainland in the old gym, it was like prime time. I was always asking, why do we have to get there during the freshman game when there's two other, there's, we have to watch another game just to watch Vince game. And that's how packed it was. If you weren't there by the end of the freshman game, you were not getting a seat. That's the court we used to play on right there. Sports was our way of um, uh, uh, peace and um, my way to find a way to get out of our environment. By the time we got to high school, you know, we was already groomed and ready to go. When you have such a marquee player and, and, and a player with, you know, national notoriety, you know, everyone wants a front seat, you know, to, to experience that. We used to play our games at seven o'clock at night. We had a line of people trying to buy tickets in our gym. And it got to the point where we had a gym full with people in both stands. It was amazing. Like every every game, no matter where we went, was, was jam packed. It was standing room only. At that time, he was getting taller and taller and taller. My freshman year in high school, I was like five seven, uh, and I was a, I was a point guard, and I ended up being the starting point guard my freshman year. And then got to six one my sophomore year. And I just moved up in position <laughs> as I got taller. In my senior year, I was like six five six six. There was a high school All American basketball game in Detroit at the Palace. And so Kevin Garnett and uh, Sharif Abdul-Rahim and Paul Pierce and Stephon Marbury, uh, they're all there and Vince Carter's there. I'm one of the judges for the slam dunk contest. And so uh, Vince, he comes out and does one dunk and no one wants to go after him. I've never seen somebody win a slam dunk contest with just doing one dunk. When he actually made drum major, oh my gosh. It was just like one other thing that a lot of people would come to see because you would never think, okay, Mr. Basketball is actually gonna be 
the highlight of halftime, but he would be just dancing and, and just thinking that he's the best dancer of all time, which I think he still thinks that. It was very easy to spot him. Usually he'll tell me, Tiff, I'm gonna be on the 40, I'm gonna be on the 30, I didn't need that, because he was always towering over the whole entire band. Seconds later, he's on the court having to play a game. So he was like, he was like versatile. I was like, okay, dude, like you're, you're doing, you're gonna be the drum major and you're gonna <laughs> do basketball all at the same time. And of course he did it. It's just funny when I say this, my dad played football, but he was also in the band at, as, a, as a young kid. He, I mean, definitely influenced me and pushed me when I would come uh, down to visit, you know, in Orlando, he'd have me out there whether it's working on my game, my shot. His dad got remarried to my next door neighbor. So he was always, you know, just when he'd visit his dad, he'd be next door um, and we'd play. I, um, he's my dad, so I respect him. And, you know, it's no, I, you know, this, this is gonna go along the lines of everything else about me. Uh, I I never felt the need to bash him publicly. It's tough sometimes because he was very influential in the Orlando area. And a lot of kids that he touched because he did the midnight basketball. And he was like, you know, big. So I mean, when you hear his name, you hear my name, people think it's me, but it's him, and but he was so influential, and a lot of kids grew up in like. So when I started living in Orlando, these kids now are growing up. It's like, man, your dad, your dad, your dad, because like he's a big, big time coach around there, and he's he's very influential in in in, in kids' lives and and and, and growth and success. An influence in, in basketball, he had some influence. Uh, he and my uncle Oliver Lee, uh, my uncle played in the NBA for a couple of years. Uh, played at Marquette. He used to heckle me like like nobody's business. When you hear him, you hear him. He's like, yo, take that dude out, man. He, hey, bro, 15. <laughs> you ain't got it tonight. Like, he's like, man, man, that's that's just him. Being the jerk helped you, you know, get ready for, you say you want to be a professional. Well, guess what? I, I know what it's like. This is stuff you deal with when you go on the road and playing in a Utah, in Sacramento, where it's loud and you can't hear. Or in college, matter of fact, you go to Clemson, you go to Duke. This is what you're gonna hear. But it's gonna be 19,000 of them. Yes, it's an empty gym, it sounds like this, and it's me and you can hear me loud and clear, can't you? How is it affecting you? How are you handling it? When we saw there were 77 universities that wanted him to be a student athlete, I thought, okay, maybe he's got a chance. Somehow, some way, I kind of got down to six schools, Kansas, Kentucky, Florida, Florida State, Duke, Carolina. I remember afterwards calling Tommy Amaker, who was an assistant coach at Duke, and I'm like, now what happened? Why didn't, why didn't we get him? And why did he go to North Carolina? And uh, and so we tried, but you know he, he he ended up going down the street to Chapel Hill. It's hard to say no. It's like you have Dean Smith, Bill Guthridge, speaks for herself. What won it for my mom is like his his expectations for for education and what he expected of us. So we were expected to sit in the first three rows of the classroom in the front, point blank. You know, that's, that's what's expected. So I could already see my mom, but she, you could see her just smiling at, at, at the home visit. She was happy about that. You know, I was too, she was happy. But like for me, if both worlds kind of meshed together and we were both happy, it was kind of meant to be. So I knew I made the right decision. You're at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill playing basketball. Even if you didn't watch Carolina, you saw the highlights. It was incredible. A Dookie wanted to watch Carolina just to see what kind of incredible dunk that he might have in the game. It was a little bit of an adjustment for him his freshman year. Then the sophomore year, he just started to explode. We remember events at Carolina. You know what I mean? So we knew what we were getting ready to witness in the NBA. Like, we knew it. I don't even watch college basketball. 
And when Vince was at Carolina, like, it was must-see TV for me. That's when I figured, okay, it looks like we might be NBA bound. It is a night when hopes and dreams and butterflies abound. It's draft night 1998. You could tell he was nervous because it's draft day. You know, you hear, you may go here, you may go there, but you never know. The fourth pick uh, was interesting because I worked out for Toronto, obviously. Antoine didn't work out for Toronto. With the fourth pick in the 1998 NBA draft, the Toronto Raptors select Antoine Jameson from the University of North Carolina. He gets drafted. It was like exciting. It was like, man, my roommate, my college roommate just got drafted. Like, that's cool. And then now fifth pick, you know, we're not sure. I remember my agent said this is a possible pick. You know, and, you know, so this is, we'll see. And then next thing you know, you hear your name called. The Golden State Warriors select Vince Carter from the University of North Carolina. All of the things that you think about for all these years just happen. And, and, and you know, you, you watch the draft year after year, but now you're that person there. You don't know how to react. I remember getting the hat and putting it on and... And I remember going up the steps, and I remember seeing Antoine. He was trying to say something to me, and he's mouthing it. I don't know what she's saying. I'm like, what is he saying? So I'm trying to, like, figure it out. So I go to shake the investor's hand. He's like, congratulations, you know, stand right here for a second. It's about to be a trade. I said, okay. Toronto has traded the rights to Antoine Jameson to Golden State for the rights to Vince Carter plus cash consideration. Oh, shoot, it's for me. I covered the Golden State Warriors when they <laughs> they drafted Vince and then they traded him for Antoine. And it probably goes to the heart of like the misconception of who Vince was because the Warriors at that time were trying to create a better culture. Tell me about this guy's game. Uh, he's he's going to be a, a tremendous player in the NBA. He's going to be one of those guys whose name is going to be in the NBA for a long time. Even though I looked at it and I went, there's a talent disparity here between the two. We had fought hard to, to get Vince drafted. Uh, the scouts thought that um, there were two other players that they liked over Vince. And uh, I thought in watching the video of him in North Carolina, that outside of uh, Michael Jordan as a North Carolina athlete, there wasn't anyone as close as Vince, and, and he wasn't being used at what I thought his maximum potential was. The prior regime that had left, Isaiah and them, had put the word out that there was no money in Toronto. So we basically played that to the other general managers. We'll do this deal with you, we'll do that deal with you, and you gotta give us a million dollars plus the transaction. We had a temporary practice facility at a local university, a Glendon College. That was okay, you know, certainly not the standards of NBAs today, but for back in the NBA, it was okay. Our president had told us, well, we don't have enough money to build a practice facility. I asked him, how much do we need, right? So the Vince Carter trade got us started on getting the $3 million we needed to build a practice facility. So everybody talks about what he did, and Vince created so much value in the franchise from the, the, the night he was uh, drafted he independently stabilized one NBA franchise by itself. He legitimized so much for the Toronto Raptors. Expansion franchise teams, they're not very good, right? I, I heard someone talking about the Raptors when they first started. I think the line was, when Vince was there, the Raptors were three years old, and like any three-year-old, they weren't very good at anything. <laughs> you know, we were having difficulties improving. Players didn't want to go to a losing situation. Coming off a, a tough season, you know, we're not the most attractive destination uh, for, uh, for players, uh, having only won 16 out of uh, 82 games. Besides bringing in uh, Vince, so we brought in Charles Oakley and Kevin Willis, two tough veteran players, uh, you know, primarily to sort of establish the culture and to uh, provide some experience and, and leadership uh, to the younger guys. And, and that worked well. You know, it was a lockout year, so we didn't start playing, I don't think, until December. Vince was our top rookie. And my thing was to give him respect. And when you give it, you receive it. And it was very, very easy. And after we started to get to know one another, obviously on the court, 
off the court, um, it became like a family. When you have a, a nucleus of good veterans around your two or three young players, Vince, Tracy McGrady, Alvin Williams, guys like that, that are hungry, guys that want to learn and take on this responsibility to lead the team, and Vince being our number one guy at that time, it was just fun to watch him develop. T-Mac and I were just out there playing, hooping, and just doing what we do, and that's what made it cool. They complemented each other well, I believe. They played together well, and they fed off each other. When I was asked to come do this interview, I went through my notes and I pull out the note from February, I think, 22nd of, of, uh, of 99. Um, it's the 12th game of, the, of a 50-game season. We're playing Chicago at home, and I've got all these notes of stuff that Vince Carter can't do. It was just a lot of stuff running through my mind how to continuously improve him. You know, I have to say that, that I was one of the luckiest coaches because Vince was one of those players that if you gave him the why of why he needed to do something, he can pick it up very easily. Canada was and will always be a hockey country, but I think he really inspired a lot of kids to pick up balls and head to the court, you know? I don't think that that was really something that anybody was doing before he came along, but just because of how electrifying he was, um, his highlight reels, he just made basketball seem cool. I really think Vince had a huge impact on how people in Canada appreciate basketball, and that exists today. It just shows what Vince is capable of doing. You know, being in college, there's a lot of excitement, you know, coming to the league, uh, but he just goes with the flow. But he, he ends up going to a team in Toronto and understanding that now, not just that he has a state or city, but he has a country behind him. And, uh, and he, didn't, he, he didn't sell him short because he came on the scene and uh, he exploded. And being able to win Rookie of the Year just showed how talented he was. The man that has turned the slam dunk into an art. That's the fabulous Dr. J. Julius Irvin. Dr. J was my hero, point blank period. And he so happened to be a pretty darn good dunker himself. Growing up, I taped the dunk contest every year to where I remember sometimes, you know, when you play a tape too much, it starts to get blurry and the screen starts to jump and all that. In my prime, you know, I mean, I started dunking the ball when I used to do uh, clinics for Converse. So, you know, I'd always, you know, I always uh, give the audience a, a dunk show. So I'm trying to figure out what he's doing pre-routine before that dunk. And that's what helped me expand my creativity. You have guys who can jump really high that can dunk, and then you guys, guys who can jump really high with creativity, which kind of separates you from everyone else. Playing in the NBA was a dream, obviously, but the dunk contest is what, like, I studied. Like, I was like, this is it. The reason Vince slam dunk contest was so good, he was just head and shoulders above everybody else. It wasn't, uh, as we say, it wasn't a fair fight. I knew he was a favorite. I don't know if the world knew he was a favorite. All he did was say, here come a handful of dunks. Good luck to the rest of you. Right about now, I am thinking about all the times I tried this dunk, and it looked awful. As I put that head down, that's when I was like, we got it. Let's go home! Let's go home! Ladies and gentlemen! It was over before he even got to the finals. Really, after the first dunk, that was already it. I mean, that, that was the dunk I'll, I'll, I'll always remember. I wanted to set the tone. First dunk. Not a, oh, okay, okay, all right, he's warming up. No, 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 I'm ready, I'm here. Like, if you don't get on this level. The dunk contest is on one side of the floor. And when 
Vince would come up the dump, the whole arena would run to the other side. It was that crazy. On this next dunk, I'm trying to show distance while doing a windmill. Kenny Smith, the only judge not to award a 10. What's going on there? The nine dunk was a 10 in any other setting. And that first dunk just set a tone in the building. But I said, that is the new 10. So with this one, we had to use a teammate. So we get out there, it's like, all right, what am I doing? I said, stand right here and just, just bounce it and then back up. He's like, man, what, what, is, what are you about to do? I said, you'll see. He incurred an injury dealing with weights in the weight room, so he stitched up in the left hand doing all this. It's over! It's over, ladies and gentlemen! I don't have, like, catchphrases, and I don't know if he heard me or not, but at the same time, he goes like this, it's over. And Kenny going crazy, tell me, it's over, it's over. I just attempted a dunk that I've never tried before. Like somebody, uh, the dunk guys or somebody, somebody, it's, thank you. <laughs> he pointed up at the Raptors like this, and that forever stuck with me. So when it came down to 2016, we were in Toronto, I made sure I pointed up just like he did, you know, uh, as a tribute to Vince, you know, I had to do it. I am literally making these dunks up right here in front of you tonight and pulling them off. You can't tell me nothing. It's over. You can't tell me nothing. He was a genius in a physical way. And in, in that, like, he could just imagine something and then execute it. You know, these, these unbelievable physical acts that for most people would be like, I got to do this over and over again. Dunk number four, what do I want to accomplish in this dunk? As I turn around, I said like a quick prayer. Okay, don't kill yourself. So when I walk by, I'm just rubbing it last second just to say, you know, just to kind of prep it, you know, for this, because I don't know if it's going to hurt or not. And as I go, I just remember taking that one, two and jumping up higher. With his first on the final round. <laughs> I closed my eyes to hold on, and I wanted to hear nothing. I think we were just all in awe of, of what he did that, that night. I just remember landing like, looked around, and the first thing you're gonna see is Shaq's face. And it wasn't that, that he just stuck his whole arm in there. It's like he put it there and just kind of gave you a couple of these. Because he knew that people were gonna have to catch up with the idea of what he just did. Because it wasn't through the legs, it wasn't the other things that he did, it was this dude just went so high that he basically just jammed his arm into the basket. He said afterwards, he said he did stuff that he had never practiced. <laughs> so it was like creativity on the spot. That's probably why it was so good. He just owned the night, he owned the arena. And to me, it'll always be the single greatest dunk performance that I've ever seen. He's in a class by himself when it comes to dunking. Like, he's simply in a class by, you don't, you can mention whoever you want him. It's some great dunkers out here. You can mention all those guys, and I would ditto. But when you try to compare somebody to Vince Carter, I don't want to hear it. It was a, a whole different environment. He ignited a country with a dunk contest. He put Canadian basketball on the map. The Toronto Raptors basketball team hit the court at the Air Canada Centre. The crowd went crazy when the dunk master himself, Vince Carter, made his grand appearance. This sanity, to me, it means the dawn of a new era, the dawn of a new culture. You know, Vince was taking over the league. He was going crazy, man. He had now established that he was more than a dunker. He was scoring yeah, 50 balls, 40 balls, 30 balls, you know, night after night after night. Half man, half amazing, right? Only I think at some point he just became all amazing. You know, with me, like we would be in the locker room and we knew he was getting ready to play against Vince. And all I was just telling the big man, just watch your head, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he will make you a poster. 
Vince Sanity is cool, um, and I think Air Canada is probably the better one, though, because I grew up in Sacramento. Jason Williams was a rookie that year. This was pre-Instagram, pre-House of Highlights, pre-Internet, everything. Um, and so for a guy to be in Toronto, and it's the, I think, fifth year of the franchise even, um, he really opened the door to that whole country. And so I think that's the piece when you look at the legacy that, that really sticks out to me is like how much he could put that city on the map. Even though he might not have been Canadian, like a lot of us kind of just accepted that he might be, or like we want him to be. And that was, that was a big part of, I think, of a lot of our development um, at that age. With one of his signature slam dunks, Toronto Raptor Vince Carter inaugurated a new state-of-the-art basketball court in Etobicoke today. Carter, through his charity, the Embassy of Hope Foundation, built an NBA-sized court with a pro surface and lighting system valued at $130,000. It's a gift to the kids in the Dixon and Islington neighborhoods. I just hope it, it creates a lot of great basketball players. I mean, we're not, we're not here to really create NBA superstars or anything, but I think just instilling confidence in each, in each and everybody here and giving them some place to play. I'll never forget, we went to the mall. I'm with Vince Carter, and at the time, Vince Carter was like really Vince Carter in Toronto. Like everybody knew Vince Carter, so it was like people looking. And then it got to the point where we had to run out the mall, like run. We went downstairs, got to the car. And when we got in front of the mall, we got surrounded by people. Like it was crazy. Like people around the car, Vince, 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 surrounded, but we couldn't drive. And I was just like, Oh, like, I was in awe. My mouth was open, Vince was like, man, I told you this is crazy. It didn't take long before Vince's face was on bus benches, buses, sides of condos, uh, it, just everywhere. Most players are playing for their city or for an adopted fan base. Playing for and having the responsibility of not only being the star for an entire country in terms of that sport, but also for a relatively new franchise that basically was depending on Vince to take them to the promised land. The first time they made the playoffs was because of Vince Carter. What they were gonna do internationally and sort of making their mark in the league was gonna be because of Vince Carter. That's a lot. Life is a little different, a little more media coming around. My confidence is at all time high. I'm playing pretty good basketball. I receive a phone call from USA Basketball and them saying, we, we want you on because Tom Gugliotta got hurt. And would I accept? Would I what? Would I accept? Man, can't even tell you what I said. Watching the Dream Team, watching Dream Team 2, so you're talking about 92, um, 96, were that next group after Dream Team 2. I was just elated to, to join the, the group. I remember getting that jersey and taking those photos because <laughs> I remember seeing the original photo, and then all of a sudden, I see the new photo, like they photoshopped me right on in. You know, just sitting there like this. I was like, I, did, I took that picture by myself. When we got Vince, you know, for that 2000 Olympics to Australia, we all knew once he took flight, no one was gonna jump with him. I was excited. Uh, I think Gary Payton was excited because we had another weapon that we could throw a lob to above the rim. Yeah, it was Payton, still goes right at it. I don't know how Gary Payton misses that easy layup. Let's start by that. I'm thankful for it because it became a historic play. It's just one of those things, that right place at the right time. Uh, guy gets the ball and he throws it behind the back pass and I see the, <laughs> the lane and I was like, I'm jumping too far. As I hit him, I'm looking past him. Carter, it's oh! 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 <laughs> I'm celebrating, I made it because I knew I jumped too far. Meanwhile, KG is cheering for something totally different. And after the game, Gary Payton actually had the play on their camcorder. That's how I found out that I jumped over him. When he jumps and takes off, it's like in slow-mo you go, did we just see him jump over this guy? It was just incredible. You know, that was just a 
tribute to his athleticism, his creativity, and you know what a what a good adrenaline rush can do for a person. To get over a whole seven footer and dunk it clear with barely pushing off, that's like one of the most ridiculous dunks of all time. We still talk about it to this day, and it kind of launched the shoe too because he was in a transition. I think from Pluma to Nike, and this is when the shock was was coming. And so um, when he did that, it was incredible. I tried to put on those shocks. I, it didn't it didn't work for me. I didn't jump like that. Vince in particular just didn't have a great first playoffs, which of course he didn't. I think he was 23 years old. You just need the experience of playing in the playoffs and understanding what it's about because it's a totally different basketball game than playing in regular season at any point. The Knicks beat us down, took a little abuse from the media just because, oh, he couldn't get his team a win. You know, they were just better than us. And we were learning, and I think T-Mac had a great series. It was a positive sign, you know, even though we got swept, I think. Uh, it was, those games were pretty close, and we showed that we were pretty competitive. It was uh, a real a real sign that, that we had, again, taken another big step forward in establishing, our, establishing ourselves as a good franchise. One of the key issues we faced was the Tracy McGrady free agency. Back then, there was a different rookie contract when a player got drafted. You know, the potential loss of Tracy and, and his, you know, inability to commit one way or the other to signing with us or another team sort of put the team in a real bind. You want everything to be smooth when you're trying to keep a guy like, like a T-Mac or, you know, with all the potential, you know, you want everything in your organization to be running smooth. And it kind of just started to get a little bumpy. In my end of the year meeting, I presented that if Grunwall and I, um, could sign Tracy McGrady, would the franchise consider moving Grunwald up to president and, and give me the coach and GM title? I think that Tracy, with the style that they were playing in Toronto and sort of the way the Raptors coaches used him, he certainly didn't feel like a main guy, and that was part of why he wanted to depart for Orlando. I didn't get as much as playing time as he did. It was Vince Carter's show. Couldn't talk me out of it. I mean, I hate it. Vince, I hated to leave you, but it's a business, baby. <laughs> I hated to leave, but, uh, you know, I had to do what's best for me. It hurt a little bit, you know, but that's the way it goes, and, you know, I slept on it, so with now. Um, uh, but definitely, that's, it's tough to swallow. Uh, I, I guess when they feel, you think they feel one way, and when they leave, here comes the truth, I guess. When two guys aren't talking directly to each other, then it just becomes, well, he said this about you. What I remember is Charles Oakley getting in the middle, basically, and handing one of them the phone that the other one was on and saying, here, work this out. We were too close and, 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 and too tight and having too much fun together for this to seem real. When Tracy elected to leave to go to the Orlando Magic, it, it you know, it was... I don't think it hurt us that much initially, but I think over the course of time to lose a talent like uh, Tracy McGrady uh, was a big setback for the long-term development of the franchise. When I heard him say, I'm getting an opportunity to play in front of my family, my home crowd, like where I'm from, I'm like, shoot, <laughs> if I had that opportunity, I'd do it too. So it was no ill will, no hard feelings. The sad part was if Tracy would have been just drafted out of high school where he lived, and come to Toronto, um, he would not have had such a uh, tug of heart to go back to Florida. You know, everyone wanted to re-sign Tracy. Vince wanted him back, and uh, but that was, a, a, you know, one of those difficult situations that an organization has to go through. Now, fans and everybody else, all right, T-Mac leaves, what happens to us? Fortunate for us, the next year, we played the New York Knicks again. And we were able to win that series, and we closed it out on their court, which was crazy. The game is over. The Toronto Raptors coming in, and in only their
their second year making the playoffs. The fact that they were able to come back the next year, and I really think it says something about Vince Carter, that you're playing the same opponent, you're put back in the same situation in Madison Square Garden, and they got it done. You have to put past the historic moment and, and the big win. Now it's a whole new challenge. It's the next round. It's, gonna, it's a little tougher because you're playing a better team. Here in Philadelphia, we're getting ready for the 76ers and the Raptors. It's game one of the best of seven, a matchup of Allen Iverson and Vince Carter. Whatever AI was doing for his team, I needed to do for my team, but better. When you talk about Vince and AI in that playoff series, it was just one of those TV moments. AI was by far one of the most gifted scorers. He was their leader. And there's another situation of a guy understanding that he's the man and his ability to score was needed. Definitely a war, obviously, because it, um, it came down to game seven. So, um, you know, it was tough for us. In Toronto, it was tough for them in Philly. If you love basketball, that series was what you wanted to see. Allen Iverson with just everything about the playground coming out in that series. And then Vince Carter with just the spectacular athleticism and the way he moved and you saw it in that series, it's just like he's lightning all over the court and they're going back and forth. And the fact that that series got to a game seven is perfect. We felt like we can go out there and compete and win the series. Getting to game seven, that's where the pressure was. We got to figure out the way, a way to have one more point than this team to move on to the Eastern Conference Final. Now, with me, I made it a little tougher because that morning I chose to graduate from college. One of my favorite people. Mm -hmm. Here it is. My phone. It's already been a busy day for Toronto's Vince Carter. Vince arrived in Chapel Hill at about 9 a.m. to attend his college graduation ceremonies. We were having a practice and I went to every player on our team. Do you have a problem with this? I gotta know I don't have a problem with it from every player on the team, management or whatever. Fly to North Carolina. I get to the hotel, turn on ESPN. All of a sudden, there's a couple players on the team have now changed their, their story and said they have a problem with me going. People said one thing, you got back and they come another way. You want to tell us who those people were? Nah, that's all right. Sorry. One of the most controversial chapters of his career there will be those who say, oh, how can you do that? You can't do that to your team. Basketball is not who he is, it's what he does. Who he is, is the guy who said, I made my mom a promise. The Raptors will have a chance to win it at the buzzer. The play was drawn up for me to catch the ball at the top of the three-point line. I remember Tyrone Hill denies that. Carter trying to get free. You've gone through all the repetitions you've prepared for, you've visualized it. Now executed. Carter at the buzzer. The first half of that shot, I'm like, oh, this is good. This is going in. I think my heart stopped. You know what I mean? And it took so long, you know, for the shot to, to rim out. So now I'm hoping for it to hit the back rim, pop up in the air, and just fall in one of those bounce, bounce, bounce going. That's that's what I'm praying for now. Carter trying to get free. We had final aspirations, and for that shot right there to go in, it would have been heartbreaking. But you flip the script, and it had to be heartbreaking for Vince and his teammates because they got the ball in the hands of the guy they wanted it. You know what I mean? And they, those guys, you ask them now, they live with that. We want Vince to take that shot. I, I, I think they rather had Vince take that jumper than someone else having a layup. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they they live and die with Vince, and rightfully so. If Vince doesn't go to graduation, oh, that right. one, are you guys in a conference final? No doubt. That's just ludicrous. 
for me, I never had an issue with that. I just thought it was a, a testament to his character. He was supposed to be celebrated for that. The, the, the fact that he did that shouldn't have never came up with the loss. It shouldn't have never even been mentioned. And for him to do something so incredible, how can you make something negative out of doing something so great, something that you wanted to do, something that you dreamed about doing, and, and something so positive? As we all know, we make some, we miss some, but the, the whole vibe of that story was that he wasn't there for shoot around, and that's not the reason why they lost the game. I was disappointed, let the team down. Hearing what people had to say uh, on TV about me going, about jet lag, about all of these things, uh, like, you know, and I let that creep in my mind. The disappointing thing outside of all of that I felt like I didn't get enough support. This is a great time to, to, to show young kids how important education is. Student athlete, not athlete student. It was a lot to take. But with that being said, I would say almost overwhelmed with pride. Anyone who works that hard for their college degree deserves that moment. When he made that decision to go to his graduation, we all was behind him. Education is so important because you, we know that your career could be over within a second. What was lost in that story was that he got his degree from North Carolina. We would all sign up to get our degree uh, and then go to work, and he had that opportunity. It was just kind of like I was out there on, left on the island by myself, which I was willing to stand tall for, trust in your decision, stick behind it, and I did. And I will do it again. Residing there, I remember talking with my agent, like, you know, it was a no-brainer. That's what I wanted to do. I was comfortable there. I did call Vince and talk to him about signing his extension because I wanted him to stay in Toronto. Um, but they had overplayed him. That led him to being injured. Some injuries you get where you need surgery immediately. Some injuries you can wait some weeks to see if it heals, and then you kind of make your decision there. Well, with that knee, the ligament, I, I, we waited in to see what was what, I ended up needing surgery. Those were, uh, um, you know, real injuries that he suffered. And, you know, I miss, he missed the end of the season uh, in the year after we lost to Philly in the, in the conference semifinals. Um, he had surgery, I believe. When I got the surgery, and my knee continued to swell and swell and swell. And I was like, uh, uh, you know, people like, man, well, he can't come back. He just, he just, I'm like, man, y'all see my knee? Like, I literally had to, a Gatorade bottle, they had to take all the fluid out, fill up an entire Gatorade bottle full. It wasn't done properly. So I had an infection. I'm still a young kid. I'm, I'm, I'm pissed. I can't be out there to play. You're talking about you taking basketball from me. Like, that's all I cared about. Like, I didn't care about anything else. Of course, he was angry about, how, you know, he was being treated and perceived in Toronto, right? And the things that, you know, the public were not privy to. Some errors in judgment, perhaps, you know, like going to a concert while he's on the injured list and getting up on stage and dancing a little bit, even though, you know, dancing a little bit is not playing basketball. You know, those sorts of things sort of, you know, didn't reflect well on Vince, and I think he got some backlash for that kind of stuff. I think he's a bum. I'm going to be there to boo him. And if I could go on the court and throw a shoulder to him, I'd do that too. Boo! Oh, what do you think Vince, of Vince, you suck! What do you think of Vince Carter? He sucks. Yeah. He sucks. Thanks a lot for all your hard work, Vince. It really paid off. Vince went from loved to hated. He was constantly booed. Raptors fans were particularly cruel. That's just the nature of being in the public eye and being a person that everyone is counting on. And, and you know, you have to, you know, understand that people are going to react to situations like that, that in, in a sort of a negative fashion. There's this old saying, like, your best player has to be your hardest worker. And Vince didn't have that reputation. Vince had a reputation of the game came really easy to him, and he would take the easy way out. 
uh, but going from sort of the you know the the Mr. Perfect to getting some criticism is is in a bit of an adjustment, and particularly when you feel like uh, you know you are hurt and you're doing your best you can and and you're trying to play through some pain. If you haven't played this game, you don't know what we go through. You don't know the bumps and bruises and the punishment we take. I mean, especially back then, you know. So they don't really understand what a guy goes through. So if a guy is hurt, and a guy like Vince I know who loves to play the game, I mean, he's, he's not faking an injury or he's not, you know, trying to get out of not playing, you know. He wants to be out there as, as much as anybody, but a lot of times the people, they want to judge you, your character, your heart. And that, 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 that young man has a big heart. It was unfortunate that, you know, it played out to where it was saying that he he was quitting. Um, I think one thing uh, I read in the media was he didn't give it 100%. If they just took just a moment and took a step back and just got to know the real Vince, they would know how he is. They would know that he always gives his all in everything that he does on and off the court. Question my love for the game is the one that pissed me off more than anything being questioned for, you know, something you love to do was tough for me to deal with. As things start to change, we get Chris Bosh in now, and the kind of the franchise wants to move in a different direction. You can feel the shift in the interest of, when I say interest, of who they wanted to be their franchise guy. You know, when it came down to that draft, um, we needed another uh, big guy. And, and so uh, I thought Chris would be, again, a good complement uh, to, to Vince and, and add some talent to our squad. The structure was extremely poor in Toronto. And at the end of the day, it didn't work. As Glenn Gronwall's time came to an end, right at the end of that season, I remember having a conversation with the organization, like, hey, you know, we're gonna be looking for a new GM. If you got anybody in mind, you know, let us know and we'll go from there. The request came uh, through their front office. I know Vince had something to do with it, you know, so just in terms of, you know, the, uh, the ownership or the management, you know, wanting to get the, uh, opinion of their best player. You know, they invited me up, and when I went to Toronto, <laughs> I was met at the airport. He didn't really get to go into the uh, facility and tour as, as the process should go. They didn't appreciate the different uh, cultures between basketball and hockey. In hockey, they view uh, you know, players is more employees, you know, versus in the NBA, I think it's a player's league or it's a partnership, I think. They felt that Vince became too big for, you know, his role of, you know, he's still just a player. And, and I think by not necessarily doing all he wanted to do in terms of the GM search was sort of the first step. I just want to play. And if you don't, if you don't want me here, just move me on, you know, and I'll get out of your way. I don't be in your way. I just want to. I just want to play. I just recall having a, a conversation with the coach at the time, Sam Mitchell, and I told him I don't want to leave. It was all directed at me and demanding to be out. I'm like, I had this conversation with him. You hear about trade possibilities, and obviously my agent gives me calls and he has updates because he was talking with the GM. And I wasn't involved, and I didn't have any real inside information. I remember. Uh, couldn't believe the trade they made. <laughs> you got a GM that trades Vince Carter for a cold six pack of beer. And, you know, I remember the day it happened where in Indiana, wake up to like 70 plus text messages, a whole bunch of missed phone calls. I'm like, what is going on? Your heart drops and you're like, all right, so what happens now? And I remember asking Jalen, I was like, okay, what happens next? He's like, well, you know, you kind of, you said, you kind of get your shit and <laughs> go on to the next team. I never felt like I had the power to say, 
you know, to dictate what I could do because they're the boss. What was your first reaction when you found out that now I'm going to the Nets? Well, first of all, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> you know, I thought my family was playing a joke on me and everything. And once it was a reality, you know, you just started thinking of, okay, what do they have and how can I fit in? And first thing you think of is Jason Kidd, Richard Jefferson. When we get Vince, I'm all excited in the summer uh, because now I'm like, oh, we got a chance to win. When you get traded to a new team, you have new energy and new life. That's just naturally. I thought we really had a chance to be successful and win the East and, and give the Western Conference a run for their money. I mean, that was an incredible time watching Vince play in New Jersey. He had uh, RJ on the, like, running the right, he had Vince running the left, and Jay Kidd was down the middle just picking and choosing who he wanted to throw lobs to. To get to play with a team, an up and down fast team, play with a guy like Jason Kidd, he made the game easy. He was trying to feel his way to, to fit in, and I told him, look, you fit in the day we got you. You just have to be you and do what you do best, and uh, I'll make sure I get you the ball. Three seconds left. Carter with two seconds. Carter for the win. Got it! Vince Carter has done it! They've been on the floor. The Nets have warming up. The reaction has not been good for Vince Carter. Why? He flat out told the fans he didn't try or didn't give it his best when he was here. So, yes, they are bitter. The first game that he returned back to Toronto was very interesting. I was kind of nervous. From North Carolina, 6'6", six, six, guard number 15. The booing was the worst I've ever heard in any sport in my entire life. He was hurt. I mean, who wouldn't be? What, what human being would not be? But he gave it everything he had. That's how you go on and you do what you did for the New Jersey Nets. Like, I was able to take off to the next level and, you know, and just learn how to score in many, in, in many different ways on top of the abilities I had coming in to um, New Jersey. So um, it was just awesome. I was traded from New Jersey to Orlando in the off season during my basketball camp. I was doing hosting a basketball camp in Orlando and have all my kids in there. And I, I just got I just got finished doing the drill with every kid in the camp, one on one, all that. Died tired. And this guy was like, "Yeah, your brother's on the phone. Your brother's calling." So I guess he called the camp director. I can't remember who had him in the phone. And he's like, "Bro, you heard what's going on?" Uh, doing the camp, what, what's going on? He's like, you just got traded to Orlando. That was a shock for me. You know, he said, you get traded. I was like, okay, great. And I said, okay, where? I mean, he told me back home. It's just, you know, it's, it's a dream come true. Vince had an opportunity to go to a team that was a playoff team in Orlando that was competing uh, at a very high level, and he, I thought he fit right into uh, what they were trying to do. He was a piece that could help. Once he got to Orlando, that's when the focus became, let me rely on, you know, creating space, you know, jump shooting, um, distributing the ball. Because everything was built to go through Dwight Howard. Here's the other thing. He, he came to a team that got to the finals the year prior. My most successful team would definitely be the Orlando Magic. Every basketball player's dream who steps into the NBA or any, any league, your goal is to win a championship. It's all, all about the right opportunity. Orlando might have been the one that I felt, okay, we still had a chance. That's when he started to expand his game a lot more. Because when he got to Orlando, as he started, stepped out, uh, started taking more of a ball handler role on, uh, started knocking down the long ball a lot. He handled his role very well and did it at a very high level. He can tell you probably today that he put his best foot forward to win a championship and just came up short. We lost to the Boston Celtics in six. And they ended up playing the Lakers in the finals again. So 
um, it was just uh, that. That's when I was like, uh, I'm gonna miss my my opportunity. Have we seen the best already that Vince Carter has to offer? I tell you, the biggest problem with Vince Carter. He's a nice guy. I never met a great player who wasn't a bit of a gruff, who would, just, would slap his mama to get a rebound. Is he competitive enough? He's just a guy with a ton of talent. He has not pushed himself. Like I say, I just think personally, he's just too nice of a guy. He doesn't have that edge. That's what I mean. You should try to wear this. Neither one of us should try to wear it. I think about it. I think that was just. I was in Jersey. These are old. These are my Christmas edition that I never wore. It's supposed to be for Christmas. Imagine. But you got traded before Christmas. Uh, I want to say that, yeah. Yeah, that year. We had NBA trades of the blockbuster variety. Going to Phoenix, Vince Carter. They kind of swapped uniforms there. Money was a consideration. Expiring contracts, a consideration. It came out of the blue, out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, you all, when it happens, you're like, well, our team was good. It's not like our team was losing. For us in Phoenix, the year before we got to the conference finals, Amari leaves. Um, some things changed with our team. And so, um, and those changes weren't working. And so then it was, okay, um, you know, what can we do to, to fix things? And we brought Vince in and, and, and uh, Gortat, who was his teammate in Orlando. And so there's always, you know, when it happens, you know, you hate to see guys leave, but you're, you're excited about the possibilities. Phoenix was a tough situation for me, I think, more than anything, because that's when my reserve role started. It was an adjustment. I think that was, for him, sort of the first time now where, like, the ball's not in his hands. You know, I, I think in Toronto, I think in New Jersey, even playing with Jason Kidd, uh, the ball was in his hands a lot. He was in pick and roll. He was able to do some things. And now, all of a sudden, we're in Phoenix, and the ball's in Steve Nash's hands a lot, you know, and rightfully so. The first game was kind of the weirdest and the most awkward for me. You know, you're as a starter. You've been a starter for all these years. And to now sit on, sit there on the bench, kind of waiting your turn, it was, it was different. It's a shot to, to your ego a little bit. You say that you're willing to do whatever for a team. This is putting that to the test. And do you mean what you say? A lot of great players can't adjust to playing a different style of basketball. And, and they can't deviate from that. But I think that's when, when Vince started to pivot a little bit. I went home that night, you know, kind of sulked <laughs> and just tried to find my way and kind of get together. I think it really helped him accept and embrace sort of where he's at and maybe also where his future's at. Uh, that was the toughest year uh, out of all of them, I think. Well, it was Phoenix and just learning how to handle that new role. I think it really contributed to his longevity. I asked myself this question. Does starting mean that much to you or being a closer and a finisher of a game mean more to you? I remember having a conversation with him talking about this is interesting to me and whether it was working with some of the younger players, whether it was, oh, that experience of coming in off the bench and sort of how the game changes and the chemistry of a, a basketball game changes at that moment. And it struck me in the moment that he was curious about other things besides being the A number one superstar who was dunking the ball. And that if he was intellectually curious and excited about other parts and little folds and facet of the game that you can get from being a role player. That to me, I remember back on that conversation and thinking, oh, this is gonna be interesting. And it was. You can't have an ego in this league or it's gonna get checked. You know, even the greatest, Michael Jordan, he, I mean, his ego got checked too. He needed people, you know what I mean? He wasn't gonna be able to do it by himself. LeBron he had to go find some people in Miami. So no matter how great you are, your ego always gonna get checked. So he did it for himself. I hold Vince up now as an example when I have conversations with guys as they get toward the end of their career about what do you want to be? And I think Vince did something 
so fascinating by deciding what I want to be is a basketball player who plays basketball. And that sounds super simple, but when you are decoration at the end of the bench because you are ring chasing, as people like to say, if you are going to the team where you think you have the best chance to win that hardware, but you're really mostly just a locker room presence or a, play, a practice player or something, you can do that if you decide the most important thing is I want to cap off my, my career with a ring, but then you're not really playing basketball in the same way. And Vince decided I want to play. Obviously, I, I enjoy playing, playing and, you know, being a starter or whatever. You know, I just wanted to to finish games if, if possible. And I still got a chance to finish games. Um, at that time, I just, had to accept it and learn how to deal with it. And, and you know, it's, it's tough for a lot of guys to do that and understand, like, when you're, you played a starting role for, for so long, and then now you're asked to, to play a reserve role, which you're not used to, being able to handle it, I felt like I took it like a champ. Um, did some studying to figure out how to be consistent at it. And it kept me around for another 10 years. I started, I started getting into the, um, on, on, on the YouTube and watching like Ginobili, uh, Vinnie Johnson, some of the great six men in the NBA history and learn from them and try to incorporate my style of play, who I am, into that. And here I am. Just give me your initial reaction to now being a part of the uh, defending world champion Dallas Mavericks. Um, I mean, what can you say? They've accomplished the, the ultimate goal. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call from you know, the, the Mavericks staff. Wow, we get a chance to convince Carter. <laughs> I mean, we definitely got to do that. You know, he came to us from Phoenix where he didn't have much of a role anymore. And um, everybody was kind of saying it was phasing out, but uh, I think he was kind of holding back. Vince came to me and asked, if he could be our new sixth man. The vast majority of NBA players um, are not gonna knock on your door and say, hey coach, can I come off the bench? <laughs> I mean, that's, generally that's not the dream. He was phenomenal. And, and you don't often, if ever, get a guy like Vince who had been in the league a long time at that point, but had only been with us one year. The guy was, was pure class here. He knew a bigger role was coming for him. Uh, he came off the bench and he was an instant offense for us. He not only wanted to help the team, but he wanted to challenge himself. And, you know, the, the things that you actually have to do to go from being, you know, a perennial all-star and a starter to being a sixth man, you've got to reprogram how you think a little bit. And, and I'll tell you, Vince was as good a sixth man as I've ever seen. It's an evolution of a guy embracing his role. You can be a six man, but you can play starters minutes. You know, if you're playing upwards of 30 minutes a game, does it really matter if you started? Vince was, a, was not only an athletic player, but he was, a, he was clutch. In 2014, you know, we're playing the Spurs in a, Dallas-San Antonio is a big rivalry. That play that we ran against the San Antonio Spurs that night, we've ran a hundred times probably, and it, it never really worked. Right before we're walking out, Coach Carlisle um, comes to me, he's like, hey, you might get this ball, be ready. We're down two with 1.5 seconds left, and we had a play that we had worked on where Vince would peel off to the corner that's a tough place to play uh, and to make a play with, with short time because you've got to turn around all the way. Pump fake just to get him up and then shoot it and leave it up there with confidence. <laughs> To 
see that shot go in was unreal, you know, because I date back to 2001. Carter at the buzzer. Elgo. Twelve years later, I get the opportunity again, finally, to, to, to redeem myself for me. It was one of the most exhilarating um, moments I've had as a coach. And for him, for him to have that moment in a playoff series like that, um, it was just phenomenal. It almost seemed like the tougher the shot, the more easy he made it look. And um, that's why he's one of the greats. Every time I received knowledge, I was able to incorporate it in, into my game and could see, could see positive things happening. You know, I had Charles Oakley who played with Michael Jordan. I had Kevin Willis who played with Dominique Wilkins. I had Dee Brown who played with Larry Bird. I had Doug Christie who played with Magic Johnson. Those are some of the elite of the elite that has played this game that these guys have played with can share knowledge with me of how they watch them operate on and off the court. Just wanted to come out here and show some my support for, of course, the rookies that we had last year and, uh, and, and for the new guys. So uh, for me, it was a goal to come out and get myself in shape and just, you know, practice with these guys and just, just give them as much knowledge as I can. If it wasn't for me playing 20 plus years, a lot of coaches wouldn't allow me to be the player coach and have a voice. I'm very appreciative that these young guys, you know, obviously they, they, view, they, they view me as a, as a teammate like anyone else, but they know I've been around and they value um, my knowledge and they allow me to um, share and help when, when, whenever the time is right. It was like having two coaches. You know, a lot of times when games he wasn't playing, you see him up on the bench telling guys, really, to, you should be here, be there, just giving them different type of uh, information, the things that can, they can use to help them. He was just trying to do what he could do or give whatever he could give to help his teammates win. This is one of two things that I'm proud of. Um, I won the Twyman Stokes Award for basically it's the Teammate of the Year Award and you're voted by your peers, your, you know, players around the NBA, not just your current team, but all players vote on this award, and, and I won it. And I view this um, at the same level, in my opinion, as an MVP. Vince had just the humility and, and the perspective and, and the desire to be in this game that led him to be able to, to play a role, that led him to be able to go to Memphis or Sacramento or Atlanta. He just wanted to, to, you know, not just keep his career going, but to do it in a way that was meaningful. And that's meant mentoring younger players, setting an example in terms of his daily work ethic, passing along what he knows. That's a, it just speaks to Vince's generous spirit, I think, as a, a player and as a man. There's no, player that I'd rather have around all these young kids today to mentor. I think that's what the, the best thing he can do his last, the last few years. Yeah, because you want to emulate him as a player, but the main thing, you want to emulate him as a person. There have been a few times in the last few years I thought, well, I wonder if this is it for Vince. And then he still shows up and he still hits shots. You know, and his game has, has changed, but every now and then, He'll give you a little glimpse, you know? He'll get up and we'll go, wow. When it comes to the humility that it takes to be a, to be a 22 year player, every year he's playing fewer minutes, he's putting up fewer points, his averages are low, it's dragging down his career averages to the point where it's like, oh, well he didn't even average 20 points a game for his career, what are we talking about? Well, it's because he tacked on seven, eight, nine years at the end that a lot of guys wouldn't have hung out for he didn't care about his career averages. He didn't care what that would do to some statistical, you know, box on a, on a website. He, he, he understood that there was another purpose for him to stick around this game. There was a value to it. I worked so hard to, to be in shape and and, and play this game to compete against young guys half my age. So I wanted to go out playing the game. 
I think sitting on the end of the bench, not being able to, to be a part of this is, you know, that would kill me more than anything. Um, obviously being the same age and Vince at the end of his career and knowing it's the end of his career, when we first got him the first year, you know, part of me thought that was gonna be his last season and what a special moment it would be to have Vince in his last season with a really young team. And he understood the role. We talked about the role of leadership and guidance. Um, but sure enough, when the season started, he had to start for us at the four. Trey was starting um, at age 20, I believe, and Vince was age 41. And so that was the, the biggest gap, 21 years of age between starters on the starting lineup. Um, so it just kind of, it showed for me how valuable Vince was and when we brought him in, but also how special he is as a player to still be able to play, still be able to be included as a starter. Vince has been in the league 20 plus years. He's past that vet point. He's a, he's an OG. Uh, everything he says, it's like, you know, he's been through it. Like you, you listen to the OGs. You wanna, you wanna be in their shoes because he's he's talking just as much as the coaches. Vince is always the first one, especially in our home games. He's always the first one on the court. He's always the first one. His routine, his vitamin, his shooting routine is he's always the first guy before the young guys go. The Toronto Raptors were in the NBA Finals the year before Vince retired, and he has been a guest analyst on the jump on our show for the playoffs for the previous five years. So we've had him at all these NBA Finals sites through the years. And this time the NBA Finals were in Toronto and there was some question about, was he gonna come up? There has been some back and forth with him and the Toronto fan base over the years at different times. But to Vince's credit, he was all in to come. And we had him on a stage outside in that Jurassic Park fan area with him, myself, and Tracy McGrady. This is dedication out here, man. It's raining. Yeah, it's, it's not a little warm. chilly. Exactly. <laughs> but they're out here because they want to, they want to witness history. history. And to have him have that moment with the screaming Toronto fans in the rain, it was crazy out there. It felt very special to me that even though he didn't get that final lap playing in Toronto, that he was there with the people. I almost think that that was a better moment, at least for me as someone who watched him throughout his career, to see him connect with everybody in that way, and especially to be there with T-Mac, felt like really just everything came full circle. He hates Toronto. He had no luck. So far from the truth. So far from the truth. I still have business in Toronto. Um, so, you know, not wanting to be there and didn't appreciate my time. Never, never. Definitely appreciate it. I still appreciate some of the people that are there, still talk to them to this day um, in the organization and around the city. That's a big point of conversation that day is, you know, what's going on with the league? What's going on with the virus? Uh, what's next? The, the owners, organization in general, we're all in the locker room talking about the scenarios. If this happens, uh, if somebody tests positive, this was what would happen. We're leaving the locker room and we're about to break the huddle. And I said, hey, you know, this could be our last game without fans. That was my message. This could be our last game without fans. And Dwayne Dedman, without missing a beat, says, this could be Vince's last game without fans. We're coming out to have time to shoot and uh, LP comes up to us and just tells us, uh, tells me and Vince that the season's probably gonna get canceled, that the Thunder and the Jazz game just got canceled. Coach Pierce says, you heard about what happened to Rudy Gobert. He's like, he tested positive. And now we know something's going on and we understand this is probably it for us. We still have a Second half to play, try to get back in this game, get us a win. We're still focused on the game, so like we're so far behind, we don't even understand what the world's talking about and going through. And then get to about the fourth quarter, midway in the fourth quarter, Dwayne Dedman leans over to me and he's like, you know this might be your last game. Damn, you know what? This might, like, 
this might be it. Fans are starting to chant, like, we want Vince, we want Vince. You just start hearing Vince, Vince, Vince from the fans, and everyone's chanting to get Vince back in the game. It hasn't even crossed my mind. DeAndre Brimmer's like, oh, we want Vince. Like, I'm like, hey, man, sit down, chill out. Let's get this over with. I don't think he wanted to go in. Uh, I think the, the crowd chanting, we want Vince, um, kind of persuaded the whole bench and LP to, to put him in. And made eye contact with LP. And he looked at me. And I turn and I look at the bench. I look down at the bench and all of the guys are basically tugging at and pointing at Vince and telling him to get up. But he looked at me and he kind of was like, go in. And it just like, <laughs> everything changed that fast in an instant. And they're gonna put him in. From that point, it was just kind of like, what's going on? Like, this might be it. For me, a lot, of, a lot of things ran through my mind. I mean, I was thinking about my season being over with. At the same time, I had a guy right to my next to me, right, that uh, this could be his last time ever playing an NBA game. And then I remember Trey said, hey, we're going to get you. You're going to take the last shot. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever, whatever. Because I'm still processing, and I hear him, and I understand it, but I was like, all right, cool, whatever. New York kind of knows we're get, running the shot for Vince anyways. Um, but in the event that they didn't, we had something there. And Trey did exactly that. He drove it. Three guys collapsed on him, and he just pitched it back to Vince. And in a classic Vince moment, he steps right in off the bench, hadn't played the last, you know, 15 minutes, and he drains the three. Well, that's what they're going to do. Carter for three. Get in there. With a great Vince Carter. Thank you, it went in, and it was just a great moment. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was able to walk off, and it was kind of like, all right, I made the last shot, so the ending is there if need be. It was a crazy moment. I was, I'm, I'm going to be able to tell my kids someday that I gave Vince Carter his last bucket in the NBA, so uh, that's something that I'm, I'll never forget. So I thought it was a great moment, not only for him, who knew, at the time that that would really be his last game. Uh, but what a great ending to a career and what a great moment for the fans. And I think the reason that moment struck such a chord with everyone was it was completely organic. It wasn't some big hoopla organized celebration. It was just the people in that building who knew how important Vince Carter was to the game and that this moment must be respected. And that being just natural, feels like I've been retired for about a year or so um, because of my internal clock and how things have operated for 20 plus years. Most guys, you can put markers. With Vince, it's just like he lived this NBA life and you almost have to look in retrospect and say, oh, so this is what he, like, this is what he was in this period, but it, it was just this natural conversion of who he was over the course of his, over the course of his career. I did not think it was going to last. Like I just didn't. I didn't think he was going to guy. Guy going to play two decades. Never, never. When you people think of me, you know they're going to think of dunking. So when I'm asked about what I want people to remember me as or my legacy, I don't talk about the dunking because I know that's going to take care of itself anyway. You know, he just wanted to show people that his game was on the ground as well as in the air, and that he could be this fundamentally sound player who could do it all, and he did. Vince Carter keeps the game pure. He filters it, and he doesn't allow the, the, the negative things to fall through. That takes a lot to carry the league, which he did, and then mentor guys who couldn't carry his shoes at times. That takes a real humility, and I, I admire him for that whether it's seeing him working on his broadcast career or knowing the time and effort that he's put in to maintain his athleticism, uh, my, my view of him has, has changed dramatically. And, and I think what makes it most authentic is that 
Vince wasn't trying to persuade anybody. He never made a concerted effort like, I'm gonna change your view of who I am. I'm just gonna continue to be who I am and then eventually you'll get it. So, Vince, I got it. To tell a guy who's been as great as Vince or a Carl Malone or a Patrick Ewing or myself that your life sucks because you didn't win a couple more basketball game, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I think it's stupid. And for him to maintain his excellence for this long is incredible. That's what makes him special. Nobody who's made it to the NBA didn't spend how many hours on the court, sometimes after the sun goes down when they were supposed to be home already, just getting in a few more shots. I just want to play a little bit more when no one was watching, when they're 11 years old. And Vince, to me, epitomized toward the end of his career that I just want to just let me get a few more shots up. That's a love of the game, man. My, my favorite thing about Vince Carter is who he is as a man, is who he is as a person who he is as a friend, who he is as a family member. Um, everything that he stands for um, with being a great man on and off the basketball court. Hall of Fame player indeed, but definitely a Hall of Fame man. Am I a surefire Hall of Famer? Uh, you know, I hope so. I would love to be in the Hall of Fame. If I do uh, have that opportunity, it'd probably be a Toronto Raptor. I want people to see me more than just a dunker. I want you to realize that I have, it's more to me and my game than just my ability to dunk. That's the mentality I created. Uh, that's, the, that's just how I've gone about it and learned, and, and that's what I expect for myself. If you're going to wear the uniform, you want to go out there and compete. It was about fulfilling the love that I still have inside for the game. Thank you.